Open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Of course, today being Easter, it is a day that, uh, again, man has set aside to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason I say it that way is uh, God didn't command us to have this day of celebration. But uh, any time we celebrate Christ or the resurrection, it's a good thing, okay? So don't get me wrong. Uh, but because of Easter, most people's minds, at least at some point today, will think about Jesus. You say, well, they'll think about bunnies and eggs and all that stuff. Uh, you know, most of the world by now knows about Jesus and understands what we're celebrating today, the resurrection. Now, does that mean that they are children of God and go into heaven? No. A very sad fact. Many, many, many people today will reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a truth. In other words, they, they think it's just a story. They will reject it being true. The Bible tells us very plainly where they will spend eternity. If you reject the message of Jesus Christ, you have the lake of fire waiting on you for eternity. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't make the rules. That are the, that, it, that are the rules, if you want me to say it that way. Uh, maybe even sadder, there are some people that actually believe that Jesus came and died and rose again, but they don't understand why he did it. They've never applied it to themselves and understand that they have a need and they've never called out and asked God for salvation through Jesus. And the Bible says that these people will spend an eternity in the lake of fire if nothing changes. And the third group, probably the most sad, there's going to be many, many people sitting in church today that hears the gospel message that does not respond and leaves not knowing Jesus as their personal Savior. And the Bible says where they're going to spend eternity. Now, I say all that. You say, well, you're a preacher. You have to say all that. Yes, but it also goes along with what the psalmist is saying right here in Psalm 116. Please look at this psalm. I'm going to read these uh, verses first, and then we'll talk about them one at a time. Look at Psalm 116, verses 1 through 7. And I want you to think, even before I read this, what is our greatest need? What is your greatest need? You know, we have a lot of needs. We have a lot of things we think we need in life. Well, I need more money, or I need this, or I need that. What is our greatest need? And by the way, this is something none of us like to think about. We like to push it out of our mind, but it's my greatest need and it's your greatest need. You're going to see it right here in this text. Look at verse 1. We'll, we'll read verse 1 through 7. This whole psalm's good. Please take it home and... And study more of it. I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because He hath inclined His ear unto me, therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. Verse 3. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me, and I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. I don't normally do this, but I want you to skip the first two verses. We're going to end with the first two verses, and I want you to go to verse 3 here in this text because it shows us what our need is. Look at verse 3. The sorrows of death compassed me. Now again, this is the subject we don't want to talk about, but it's the subject we all face, and that's death and what happens after death. Uh, why do people not like to think about death? Because it's not a good thing to think about, is it? No matter what you believe about death, it's not a good thing to think about. We, we don't want to think about that time where we stop living on this earth. Uh, Brother Johnny, it's so funny how uh, devotions and Sunday school classes go along with the sermon. You said today that do you ever get something that grabs a hold of you and don't let go. Look what this verse says. Look at this. The sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I love that. 
and I found trouble and sorrow. What's he saying? I'm going to break down these words for you. But what he's saying is the thought about his death and the thought about what happened after death, he couldn't get it out of his mind. It concerned him. Uh, can can y'all just, everybody pay attention to this one thought. Does your death and what happens after death ever concern you? Again, this is one of those things people like to push out of their mind. I'll think about that sometime later because it's not a happy thought. The psalmist here says, it got in my mind and I, I couldn't get it out. It kept coming back. It got a hold of me. The word sorrows here means ropes or cords. It, it was like it wrapped around him with ropes. It tied him up. Uh, the word death here obviously just means dying. The thought of his death was the first thing that he couldn't get out of his mind. Guys, I hate to bring you bad news, but it's going to happen to all of us sitting in this room sooner or later. Death is coming. Oh, I don't want to think about that, but it's coming. No matter how much you push it out of your mind, it's coming for you. Right. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Well, I don't know. Well, look at the rest of this verse. The sorrows of death can pass me. So the, these, uh, these heavy ropes, these worries about death had him. And now look at the rest of it. And the pains of hell get hold upon me. Uh, the word hell here is speaking of Sheol. It's speaking of Hades. It's speaking of what happens after death. And it's the same type thought that he gave before. It, this thought has grabbed a hold of me and it will not let go. Guys, death is not the end for anyone. When you step out of this body, when this body quits breathing, that's not the end for anyone. Sadly, there's a lot of people that think, well, when I die, that's it. So I, I better live my life to the fullest. Our Creator told us that's different. That, that, that's not true. Every person has an eternal spirit that will endure for eternity. And right here, this psalmist says, it was the pains of hell. The word pains means something tied again. It's just like the rope. Something that had grabbed a hold of him. And he said, it is Sheol, it is hell that is scaring me to death. I know I'm going to die. And the psalmist knew that he was lost. Guys, without Jesus Christ as your Savior, every one of us, that is the place we will go for eternity. It is a place that is separated from God. It is a place that has eternal punishment. So please look right here in this verse. He's scared of these two things. He's scared of dying, and he's scared of that place of judgment after death. The sorrows of death and the pains of hell had grabbed a hold of me. Uh, at some point in your life, I pray that these two things will wrap a hold of your mind and won't let you go. You know what that's called, by the way? It's called conviction. Brother Johnny, you were convicted to bring that word. That's why it wouldn't let go of you. I can tell you from experience, you're going to try to let it go, but it's just like ropes. You're going to be tied up and you can't let it go. Is death worthy of our fear? Y'all think about it for a minute. Is death deserving of our fear? Should we be scared of death? The Bible calls death our enemy. In fact, it is the last enemy, the Bible says, that God's going to do away with. Certainly it's an enemy. And yes, without God, we should be scared of it. Now look at the last part of this verse. He says, I have found trouble and sorrow. This continues to describe uh, conviction wonderfully. Let's talk about conviction for a minute. I know everybody in this room has heard the word conviction. And we all get different thoughts. Well, it's a feeling or a bad feeling or what. The word conviction comes from the root word convince. It's when God convinces you of something. And right here, he says, I have found trouble and sorrow. The word found means I'm an owner of it. It's mine now. And again, it's the same type of idea. It's mine, and I can't let it go. And he says, I have found trouble 
and sorrow. I love this. The word trouble is not a verb, it's a noun. You say, I don't care. Yeah, you do. Uh, the Hebrew word here means a vexer or one who vexes you. Now, y'all let that sink in for a minute and think about it. Who is the one that vexes us when we're under conviction? Do we actually have someone that's sitting there keeping those thoughts in our mind? Brother Johnny, why couldn't you let that go? Why did it keep coming back to your mind? Was there somebody that was there putting it back in your mind? The Bible says that's the Holy Spirit of God working. Amen. Guys, you have to have that before you can be saved. God has to be working with you. Right here he says, I've found the vexer. He's vexing me. I've found that sorrow and he says, I've also found the pain. This is the verb there, the anguish. If death and what happens after death doesn't scare you a little bit, then there's something wrong with you. Because death is real, every one of us in here knows it. And hell is real too. You know, there's a, there's a saying that says, hell is no less hot just because you don't believe in it. Death is real and hell is real. Uh, we can only push that thought aside for so long. The psalmist right here says, I have found this. Now I own this. It's in me and I can't let it go. The vexer is vexing me. I am in anguish worrying about death and worrying about this judgment. Uh, again, I believe everyone goes through this at some point in their life. Do y'all believe that? The Bible says that God wants everyone to be saved. If you believe it, say amen. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I believe that God works with every person sometime in their life. He convicts them of their need. Now, hear me close. You keep pushing that out of your mind, and God's going to finally say, okay, I'll leave you alone. You think about what you want to think. Please understand when God puts this, if you want to call it fear or vexation or whatever it is, He's doing it because He loves you. He's doing it because He's provided a way out of death and judgment. And He wants you to seek it out. Uh, did you know there's a lot of people that don't go to church because of conviction? You look at the mainstream preachers on TV today, and what they preach. They're not preaching God's Word. They're not preaching holiness. They're preaching happiness. Uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Joel Alston. Joel Alston, yeah. Uh, seems like he writes a new book every week, and it's always, this is the ten steps of being happy. Or has nothing to do with the Bible and holiness and sin or anything like that. But that's what the world is gravitating toward. They don't like to hear God's Word that says you're a sinner accountable to God. Does anybody remember the one sentence message that Jesus came preaching when He walked this earth? It wasn't, I've come to make you happy. What was the one sentence message that He came and preached? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word repent means to turn around. You've got a change that needs to take place in your life. Well, what should I do with conviction? There may be somebody here today that's under conviction. You felt that vexing spirit. You've been bothered and it won't let you go. Look at verse 4. This is what the psalmist did with conviction. Oh, this is wonderful. Verse 4 says, what's the first word in verse 4? Then. He was convicted. This is what he did. Do y'all see how that's connected? Isn't that wonderful? Then called I upon the name of the Lord. I want to go ahead and finish this verse because it's great. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Now I want to look at the last part of that verse first. That, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my, my soul. Uh, the word beseech means it's an earnest plea. It's like, God, now, please, right? He's pleading to God, and what's he asking God for? Look at this. Y'all don't need a preacher. This is wonderful. He's under conviction about death and about hell, and what does he say? God, deliver my soul. For, deliver my soul from what? 
Y'all can say it out loud. Deliver my soul from what? Hell. Do you believe that God has provided a way to be delivered from hell? Amen. I want you to look at this verse. Guys, Old Testament, New Testament, it's all the same. God's way has always been the same. And it's always been so simple. It's such a shame people reject this. Look what he says here. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. Oh, this is, this is some wonderful stuff. The word called here means to cry out. To cry out for help. Y'all listen to a New Testament verse. Romans chapter 10 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, y'all can say it, saved, delivered. Amen. Right here, that same thing, Old Testament, I called, I cried out, Upon the name of God. Guys, this is the way of salvation right here. The only way there's ever been, the only way there ever will be. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Now please get this so that you understand it, okay? What is the name of the Lord? What do we have to call out? Can I, can I go a little bit in depth with you? Can you bear with me? The word Lord here in this text is the word Jehovah or Yahweh. I'm sure y'all heard that before. That is God's covenant name to the children of Israel. Uh, what does that mean? What does it mean that God had a covenant name? Come on, y'all, just think about it and help me. What is a covenant name? What is a covenant? A promise. This was God's name of promise. In other words, my name means something. The word Jehovah, the word Yahweh, means the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming to be. The name Jehovah was a promise, I am coming to this earth. In fact, the prophecy of the Messiah goes all the way back to the book of Genesis when he said, through the seed of the woman, in other words, as a human, I'm going to come and defeat Satan and sin. Guys, that's always been the message of God. I'm coming. The name, his name, Jehovah, meant I am coming. What did you have to do in the Old Testament to be saved, for your soul to be delivered? You had to cry out, believing God is coming to take away your sin. Y'all say amen. That's wonderful. What do we have to do today? Do we cry out to Jehovah today? Guys, if you cry out to Jehovah you're rejecting that He actually came. Jehovah came. The one who was coming came. Jesus, Savior. The book of Acts says, uh, y'all turn, let's just look at it. I want us to all look together. Y'all turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Acts, chapter 4. If nothing else, I want y'all to understand salvation so plainly. Old Testament and New Testament. The book of Acts, chapter 4. And we're just going to look at three verses. Verse 10, 11, and 12. Acts, chapter 4, verse 10, 11, and 12. I want you to see this is what God says, not what Chris Garner says. Acts, chapter 4, look at verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified... Whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is where someone had been healed. They had been restored back to their physical well-being. And here the apostle says it is by the name or by the authority of Jesus that this happened, that this miracle happened. Look at verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In other words, they rejected Him. When Jesus came as the Messiah to give His life, the Jews rejected Him. They rejected Him as Jehovah, the one who was coming. They pushed Him aside. Please look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other, everybody say what the verse says. There is none other, what's the next word? 
name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one name that brings salvation and that is the name Jesus. Jesus means Savior. I've talked to people about their salvation and they say things like, well, I believe, I believe in God. Does believing in God bring you salvation? It does not. You have to cry out to the one that came and died for your sins. You know, I started this message by saying there's, there's a group of people that believe that. They believe that Jesus came and died, but they don't understand why. They've never understood that he did that to stand in their place. To pay for their sins. This psalmist said, The fear of death and hell grabbed a hold of me. And I called on the name of the one that's coming and said, Deliver my soul. What a beautiful picture of salvation. What do we have to do today to be saved? Y'all turn over the book of Romans and I'll show you. The book of Romans. Just one book over. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and look down to verse 9. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Uh, while y'all are turning, what did the psalmist want victory over? He wanted victory over death, didn't he? How many of you in here want victory over death? How many of you in here want victory over death for your loved ones? Uh, I couldn't help but think of it as Pam was playing the piano there. And I know y'all do this about your loved ones too. Uh, I think about what dad would do at different times. And uh, he was always one of the first ones to go, Amen, after the, the piano song. And, and I missed that strong Amen right there after the, uh, the piano was over. Uh, my father died, but my father has victory over death through the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, this is what the psalmist is pleading for. Give me victory over death. Romans chapter 10, look down to verse 9. And I want you to see how all the Bible works together. God never changed. God's method never changed. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, what does it say? Thou shalt be saved. Say, you know, God's message, of, message and method of salvation is very simple, isn't it? Uh, we people and religion tries to make it harder sometimes, but God's message is simple. And I'm going to ask you before I go any further, have you personally ever cried out to God and said, God, deliver my soul through Jesus Christ? Have you ever personally done that? Uh... I said when I started, probably the saddest group is people sitting in church today that know about Jesus, but they've never done that personally. They're lost, destined for the lake of fire unless something happens. Maybe they think church will get them to heaven. Maybe they think God will say, well, you've got more good works than bad works. That's not what God says in His Word. There's only one way of salvation. It's through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you have to ask for it. That's all you have to do. You have to ask for it. Have you ever asked for it? Isn't that simple? God's offering a gift, but He can't give it to you unless you say, here, I want it. Right. Have you ever asked for it? Look what it says in this, these verses here in Romans. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, you believe it in your heart, you know why he died, you know that he died for you, you know you need it, so what do you do? You call out and say, Lord, I need it! Can I have it? Uh, I've been asked before, what do you have to say to be saved? Uh, Some preachers will say, well, repeat after me and let's pray. There's nothing like that in the Bible, guys. Right here, the Bible says, you believe it in your heart and confession is made with your mouth. We've already looked at call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. It is your faith 
and you're asking for the sacrifice of Jesus to cover your sins is what salvation is. There's no exact wording that you have to say. Uh, uh, my mother often says that, that uh, she was saved when she stepped out in the middle of the aisle before she ever got up to the preacher and talked to the preacher. Talking to the preacher don't save you. It is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that saves you. Look what it says. Verse 11. For the scripture says, the word for means because. Because the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all and rich unto all that do what? Verse 12. That call upon him. Verse 13, again, just like our text, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be God's promise. God's simple, simple, simple promise. Go back to our text. What did the psalmist say? Conviction grabbed a hold of me. It wouldn't let me go. So what did he do? Look at our verse again, verse 4. Then call I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord. I beg you, I beseech you, save my soul, deliver my soul. Can salvation be that simple? Is that all you have to say? Work for the psalmist. Because look what happens in the very next verse. Look at verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The word gracious means willing to grant a favor. What happened to the psalmist when he called upon the name of the one that was coming to die in his place and asked him to deliver his soul? What happened? God gave him salvation. He granted that favor. That's why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. The word grace means a gift. And that gift only comes by our faith. Right here the psalmist says gracious is the Lord. Oh, I love this. And then he says two other, two other words. Righteous and merciful. Does everybody see that in verse 5? I'm going to give you this, this one quick. The word righteous means absolutely just, absolutely correct, absolutely holy. The Bible says he will in no way acquit the wicked. Every sin has to be paid for. God is a holy God. God's not going to say, well, okay, you can go. Your sin has to be paid for. It's either going to be paid for by Jesus Christ or by you. You have the choice. That's right. Because look what it says. He's lawful, but he's also, what's the next word here in our text? Merciful. He's willing to give you something you don't deserve. But your sin has to be paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about what Jesus did, again, a lot of people believe that he did it, but don't understand why. Uh, there was a lot that Jesus did other than just die. He willingly walked that road with the cross. He willingly took those beatings, spilling his blood. He willingly was mocked as they nailed him to that cross. He had the power, as the old song says, he could have called 10,000 angels. He willingly stayed on that cross. The Bible says that he was willingly separated from God because my sin and your sin was placed upon him. The Bible says he willingly gave up his spirit out of this life. And then the Bible goes on to say that he willingly stepped into Hades, hell, the very place that this psalmist said was scared of for you and me. Your sins were paid for on the cross of Calvary. But you have to ask for it to receive that payment. Again, God wants all to be saved, but He's not going to make you be saved. He gives you and me free choice. Uh, do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe that God works in lives and in situations? Uh, I know sometimes we don't like to think about it. Uh, I was. Said it in prayer, and and I know Nelson knows this. With what's going on with his daughter right now, God's using that. How many people I've seen touched by that situation and affected? Don't you believe that God is using that for His honor and glory? And I believe people will even be saved because of that. With all that said, do you believe God is working in your life? 
Do you believe that God maybe has you here hearing this message today for a purpose? God wants you to be saved, but He's not going to make you. Verse 6. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and He helped me. We're not going to go as in depth in the next two verses, so hang in there. The Lord preserveth. The word preserveth means to guard or set a fence around. Do you believe, the Bible says it, do you believe that once you receive Jesus as your Savior that you are secure in that salvation? Right here, the word, the idea is he's, he's preserving me. He's setting up a, a fence around me. The Lord preserves the simple. The idea is the simple is that one that called out to him. That one that realized their need. You know, the Bible says that to be saved, you have to become like a little child. And you, know what, you know what that means? Just like a little child, you have to realize you're helpless. And you just have to cry out to God for help. That's the idea of the simple here. Right here he says he preserves the simple. Not only does he deliver them, he keeps them delivered. If you've ever cried out to God through Jesus Christ, you're saved. You say, well, I've sinned since then. The Bible says that sin goes directly to Jesus. He is intercessing for you every day. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Oh, what wonderful promises we have from God's Word. The Bible says, one of my favorite passages in Romans, that we are saved, we're delivered by the death of Jesus. We are kept saved by His life. Oh, that's some wonderful stuff. Y'all say amen. Right here, here in this verse, <clears throat> verse 6, He says, I was brought low and He helped me. The word brought low means distress. That was when He was under that conviction. Guys, to be saved, you have to understand you're lost. Uh, again, religion tries to mess up what salvation is. Well, just repeat after me. To truly be saved, you have to understand you're lost. You have to get to the point this psalmist did. He was fearing death. He was fearing hell because he knew that's what he deserved. Right here he says, I was brought low. But what happened when he was brought low? Was the verse saved? He helped me. Y'all want to know something really neat? Y'all know what the Hebrew word help me is? Saved. He saved me. Y'all say amen. That's some good stuff. Amen. I was brought low, but he saved me. He delivered me. Finally, verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. In the first part of this psalm, at least verse 3 anyway, we're going to pick up verse 1 and 2 in just a second, quickly. But in verse 3, he was not at rest, was he? Right here he says, return to rest, O my soul. In other words, on the inside, your heart, your mind. He was anything but at rest. He was worried. He was concerned. He was in anguish over death and hell. Since he called upon the name of the Lord, he says, you can return to rest. That word rest means inner calm, inner, inner peace. You want peace in your heart about what happens at death and what's going to happen to you at death? You call upon the name of the Lord. Not only will He give you salvation, He'll give you peace in your heart. How many of you have experienced that peace in your heart? Say amen. amen. Mm. Return unto rest, O my soul. Look, at, What's the next word after soul? The word for means what? This is why we can rest. This is why we don't have to worry anymore, children of God. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. Obviously, the word bountifully means He's given a lot. Amen? All we have to do is call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says He gives us His righteousness, His holiness. Our sin is exchanged for His holiness. He gives us eternal life and inheritance with Him. A joint inheritance with the King. You know, until you start pondering about death, that you're going to be there. Everything that I just said don't mean anything to you. Until you get to that point of conviction realizing I am going to die in face. Exactly what that preacher is saying. If you're not there today, all you're hearing is a preacher 
doing what preachers do. Oh, he's just yelling, I'm ready to eat. But it's going to get real to you one day. The Lord is offering you and me so much through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Eternal life. The one believing in me will never die. Hmm. Do I believe that my Father is alive with Christ today? Without any doubt. In fact, He's more alive than me and you. My Father is still my Father, yet without sin now. I believe He even knows what's going on on earth. He's alive. And I'm going to see Him very soon. And as I said at the first of this sermon, his feet's going to stand on this earth again. In a new body that's not losing its hair. Uh, those of y'all that have lost your hair, Brother Johnny, uh, y'all going to have to help me when you were going through the process. What in the world did you do to try to comb your hair? Every time I go to the mirror to comb my hair, you have to comb it different. It, it changes because I keep losing hair. Our new body, we're going to have hair, Brother Johnny. Amen. Bald is beautiful. Well, hey, maybe we're all bald in heaven. Who knows? In heaven, we're not going to have the aches and pains. How many of you woke up this morning and the first word you said was, oh, Amen. that was mine. Guys, there's victory over this old world. There's victory over death and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. I hope you've gotten to the point that you've taken your eyes off of this world and understand that you need that. Let's finish looking at verse 1 and 2, please, with me. <clears throat> uh, verse 1, he says, I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice and my supplications. Now you may see why I went back to this. He says, I love the Lord and this is the reason. He listened to my voice. He listened when I called out to Him. And, and what he's doing in the rest of the psalm is explaining how he called out to Him, His salvation. He says, I love God because He did listen to me. The word supplication just means an earnest prayer. He listened to what I asked for. Do you believe that God is waiting? And that God will hear you if you call out to Him today? And that God will actually respond to you? Guys, that's powerful if you really believe that. The Almighty God, the Creator, is going to stop what He's doing if you call on Him. And not only hear you, he's going to respond. Right. He's waiting for that. He's wanting that. Right here he says, I love the Lord because of that. The Bible says that we love the Lord because he first loved us. Brother John said that in his devotional this morning. We love God because he first loved us. I keep asking you today... If you're saved, have you called out to Him? Do you love the Lord today because He listened to you and responded to you? Uh, uh, very quickly, I've told y'all this before. That last verse, verse 7 says, Return unto rest at peace. Uh, as a preacher, I get to see a lot more than people realize, I guess. Uh, I get to see what people are doing out in the pew. And uh, I may not show it, but yeah, you get to see what everybody's doing. You get to see those that are sleeping or those that are uh, drawing on something or those that are staring at the ceiling or whatever. As a preacher throughout my ministry, I have seen some miserable people in church. Uh, as a preacher, sometimes I can see that someone's under conviction before they even know they're under conviction. You can just see it. It looks like anguish and pain on their face. I've seen some miserable people. I've seen some people that try to do anything other than listen to what God's Word is saying. Their soul is anything but at rest. Before we end today, I want to ask you, is your soul at rest? Do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? Do you have that peace? You can today. Because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 2. Let's finish. I love this. 
Verse 2 says, Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, that means to bend down. He, he didn't just stop what he was doing. He, he, bend, he bent down to listen to you. The idea there is, he inclines his ear unto me, therefore, I love this, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Now this is the message to the saved person. If you are a child of God, that means God listened to you when you pleaded and asked Him to save your soul. You're not a child of God because of anything good you've done. It's just because you cried out and He gave you mercy. This psalmist says, because of that, not only am I going to love you, verse 1, he says, I'm going to call out to you as long as I'm on this earth. The idea there is, just like in salvation, I'm going to realize I need you every day. And I'm going to look for you to guide me, to lead me. I'm going to live my life now for you instead of living it for myself. As I told you, uh, it just happens so many times. It, it, it's, uh, it would be weird if I didn't believe in the power of God. Uh, Brother Johnny started that devotional this morning. I just sit there and almost shook my head because it went right along. And I'm going to end with the same thing he started with today. How many people... It, it was in, it's in my notes, by the way. How many people are chasing the wind with their life? And what I mean by that, they're chasing things of this earth. They're consumed by work. There's a lot of workaholics. They don't have time for God because of work. There's some, I guess you'd call them the playaholic, whether it's sports or, or fishing or hunting or whatever it may be. That's their passion. That's all they think about it. Some may be even wrapped up in some good things. Maybe, they're, maybe they even put their family ahead of God. Whatever it is, God says all those things is like chasing the wind. It's empty. There's nothing in it in the end. What are you living for today? Two questions, I guess, that I should ask after every sermon. Number one. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Is your soul at rest today? As he said in verse 7. And then number two, saved person. Are you living for him? Are you calling on him every day you live? Are you depending on him? Or are you still out there chasing the wind? I've seen several folks that God's gotten a hold of. You may be there today. Maybe God's got a hold of you. Maybe the Holy Spirit's already vexing you, saying you need this. Guys, if you're there, what a wonderful place to be because you can do exactly what that psalmist did. Today, you can call upon the name of the Lord and God's promise is you'll be saved. That's some powerful stuff. Aren't you thankful there is victory over death today? Man. Man. Uh, when my father died or when your relative died, think how awful it would be without the hope of eternal life. You know, the Bible says we don't mourn like people that have no hope. We miss our loved ones. We still mourn, but nothing like the world does. We have a victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. He overcome this world and we can overcome if you have faith in Him. Are you His child today? You're going to face that day of death. You're going to face that day of judgment. Are you ready today? Fathers, we humbly bow in Your presence. We thank You. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this day that we have set aside to remember Your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And that You didn't remain in that grave that you laid mine and your sins in that old terrible place and stepped back out into victory. You had victory over death. And you offer that victory to every person that will call out to you. Oh, Father, we're so thankful you've made it so, so simple. Father, I pray today, maybe there's one here, maybe it's a young person. Maybe it's someone else. Maybe it's a first time visitor. Maybe it's one that's been coming for a long time. Maybe there's one here today.
it's in that very same place the psalmist was. That fear of death and hell is starting to grab a hold of them. They don't want to think about it, but it keeps coming back. Father, help them to realize that that's you drawing them to your provision, Jesus Christ. That's you and your love pointing them to the direction of your salvation. Father, we thank you for this gathering today. We pray that we gave you glory and honor by what we did here, by what we said, even by what we thought and the decisions that we've made in our life. Right now as this invitation begins, Father, we ask your spirit to be working, working with those that are lost, working in us that know your son so that we would understand what you would have for us to do and the changes that we need to make in our life. And Father, finally, we ask you to help us as we leave these doors today. Instead of being defeated the way I was earlier in the week, not wanting to come to church, not wanting to think about these things, help us to leave here today with a mind of victory, ready to tell our friends, to tell our neighbors, to tell the world around us, about the victory that's in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray all this in that name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.